Tennessee is known as the volunteer state. Tonight, you'll find out how many of us actually have the volunteer spirit. We'll explore your options for long-term care insurance, and you'll get the facts about your last will and testament. Funding for the best times is provided by The Plough Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. During the War of 1812, Tennessee earned its nickname as the Volunteer State, when thousands of its citizens answered the call to arms and fought in the Battle of New Orleans. Today, about one out of every four Americans volunteers their time, providing billions of dollars of free labor to charities, churches, schools, and other institutions. Volunteering can give you that warm, fuzzy feeling you get when you help someone, but you can benefit as well. Volunteering can teach you new skills, help you stay active, and fill your retirement hours. It can even help you make new friends. The need for volunteers is great, so why not get off your couch and get the volunteer spirit? Bob Wallace is a 68-year-old former biomedical scientist, college professor, and journalist. When he stopped working, he met retirement head on. You know, I am not the type that is going to spend their retirement playing golf or sitting in a boat fishing. Uh, I just really, that would drive me bananas. So I was looking for something meaningful and something that would be sustaining for me. Bob has chosen to fill his retirement working as a public relations volunteer at the local chapter of the Red Cross, a role that often places him in disaster areas across the country. My job that while I'm there is to tell the story of the people who've been affected by the disaster and also to tell the story of the Red Cross response. Over and over, one of the things that, that we hear when we're out there is that Yes, the stuff that you're providing us, the food, because we, we are providing meals, uh, the water, the shelter, but having somebody there to tell their story to is really important. When Marilyn Whedon retired, she was looking for a way to stay active. When I retired, the Green Line was open, and that was so exciting. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe I can volunteer with something in relation to that. Today she stays active as a volunteer docent, leading hikes along the Tour de Wolf Trail. So it's a way to get out in the park with other people, to enjoy it, to teach them about what's available here. Teaching the history of the park is volunteer docent Bill Wilson's passion. I like volunteering. I stay as busy as I want to be, sometimes maybe a little busier. Uh, but I enjoy volunteering. Um, I get a lot out of it. I, I probably get more out of it than I put into it. Steve Freno is a 56-year-old FedEx employee, and this morning he and his daughter are delivering meals as MIFA volunteers. In my personal professional life, I have a great family, great wife, great kids. I have great hobbies, great things. I travel. I'm going to Alaska this next week to, to do a photography trip. And so, yeah, I, uh, I want to keep doing this because all of those things didn't just happen, and I, and I, I want to pay back a little bit to the, to the community and the world. In the Memphis area, slightly more than one out of every four citizens volunteers their time. That's a total of well over 300,000 people, which puts us at slightly above the national volunteer average. 
The total dollar value of volunteering in America is nearly $173 billion. Here in the Mid-South, most of our volunteers work in fundraising, followed by distributing food, mentoring youth, and tutoring and teaching. And not surprisingly, most Memphians volunteer at their church or religious organization, followed by educational institutions, health organizations, and social services. At any given time, over 300 volunteer opportunities are listed by Volunteer Memphis, the clearinghouse for volunteer services in this area. Carol Gaudino is director of Volunteer Memphis. I think if someone wants to give back in a unique and important way, I think volunteering is the best way to do that. This is a group of college students from New York. Instead of spending their spring break partying on the beach, they're packing boxes at the Memphis Food Bank. We have a staff of 40, and we could not do what we do without volunteers. Last year, we had more than 11,000 volunteers to come through our doors to help us sort and pack food to get it out. The use of volunteers allow us to be more efficient with our dollars and spend more money on food. For every dollar we're able to save with volunteer help, it allows us to distribute three meals. The next time you visit Shelby Farms, realize that an army of volunteers keeps this park running. Volunteerism is the heart of Shelby Farms Park. We are a staff of 26 that are employed here, and so we um, every year have around 35,000 volunteer hours a year. And these volunteers work sometimes weekly, daily, monthly. They give of their time to support the park. Whether it's leading hikes at Shelby Farms or giving tours at St. Jude, whether it's delivering food for MIFA or building a Habitat for Humanity home, the work of volunteers benefits the community. But with demand greater than supply, the need for volunteers in Memphis is critical. When you look at the work that uh, volunteers can do and the capacity that they add to an organization, without question, they're critical to the, to the um, operation of the organization. Carol sees a positive future for volunteering led by the aging baby boomers looking to make a difference in their communities. I think most uh, baby boomers are probably a little more discerning about volunteering and they tend to have either causes or specific organizations that they feel like they want to get involved with. So it's maybe that's the agency that I always thought about doing something for but really haven't had the time. The impact of volunteers on the community is obvious, but the act of volunteering has a surprising impact on the volunteers themselves. It, it gives me a sense of satisfaction, a sense of purpose. Uh, through my career, uh, one of the things that I've discovered, at least for me, is there was an inverse relationship between my salary and the degree of satisfaction that I got out of what I was doing. And my salary here is zero, but my satisfaction level is really high. <laughs> Studies of volunteers age 60 and older have determined that volunteering provided both physical and mental health benefits. Interestingly, similar correlations were not found among younger volunteers. So the feel-good factor of volunteering may help you live longer. Today we'll go out and deliver 13 meals, and I know I make a difference in those 13 people's lives. And, and I know that the rest of my life is still going on and it's crazy. When I get to work later, I'm gonna be half a day behind and everything, but I feel so good. I mean, there's nothing better than Wednesdays because I come in and I work on Wednesdays. And it's just very satisfying, and I, and I can go to work and I go through the rest of the day knowing that I, I made a difference. Red Cross is not a religious organization, but if you put it in religious terms that a lot of people in our community, I think, could resonate with, it helps to build one's soul, the deepness, the deep part of you inside of you. I actually love what I do here. For more information about volunteer opportunities, contact these organizations or visit their websites. A catastrophic illness that requires long-term medical care can decimate an individual's finances. 
A private room in a skilled nursing home in Tennessee costs an average of nearly $73,000 per year. Statistics show that 70% of people over 65 will need some type of long-term care in their lives. Long-term care insurance has been on the market for almost four decades, but only about 8 million people have purchased these policies. Should you? Let's take a look at the fine print of long-term care insurance. In, in my research, I've seen figures that say that people reaching age 65 today have better than a 50-50 chance of needing long-term care in the future. And of course, as, as I've indicated, long-term care is expensive, very expensive. It is. So what are the options for consumers to pay for long-term care? The real question is, how do you handle it in the future? And there's really four options. Uh, you can depend on family. You can depend on the government. You can uh, dip into your own uh, asset base or you can have insurance to cover that need. Now when you say family, we're talking about family taking care mm -hmm. of you mm -hmm. for a period of time. Mm -hmm. But then Medicare and Medicaid, talk about those two for a moment. Medicare is what most people handle after, or have after their age 65. But what people don't realize, Chris, is that it doesn't cover uh, non-medical care, which is what we're really talking about. So it'll cover physical therapy and, and, and such, but it doesn't cover uh, uh, companionship or standby care to help mama shower or dress or feed herself, uh, turn her in bed, uh, make sure she doesn't stumble. So that's non-medical care that Medicare does not cover. And most people don't realize they that don't Medicare realize doesn't it. cover that. They don't realize it. Medicaid does, but it comes at a cost. Uh, a huge cost. You have to spend down your assets to virtually nothing in order to qualify. But you also mentioned uh, self-insuring? In, in, in folks, you know, if they don't have a plan in place, then they're forced to dip into their own assets. And uh, that's called self-insuring. So when the time comes and they need care or they need to be moved into an assisted living uh, community, they have to start paying for it somehow and it comes out of their assets. And many people are shocked and amazed at how quickly that asset base can be drained. Well, when you're talking, you know, five to seven thousand dollars a month for a skilled nursing home, it, it drains it very quickly. Very quickly. Let's talk about long-term care insurance. Mm -hmm. First of all, just give me the basics of how it works. You create a plan, which, uh, and so what it does is it covers, uh, let me just talk about what it covers. It covers everything from home care all the way to hospice and everything in between, if that plan is done properly, okay? And uh, you pay a certain amount every month in exchange for a certain amount of coverage every month. And that's it in simple terms. But it, it's not that simple, it's a rel relatively complex policy, correct? Uh, the plan design can be complex correctly, so you need a professional to help guide you in that plan design. Now, are there health qualifications to, to qualify for a policy? Yes, you have to go through medical underwriting, much like you would um, through uh, getting life insurance, for instance. Although, uh, with life insurance, they use criteria that involves mortality risk, with long-term care, they use criteria that uh, revolves around morbidity list, uh, risk. So, and it's becoming increasingly harder to get it. Are there health qualifications when it comes to qualifying for the benefits? Okay, again, around that plan design, there's typically an elimination period, which you can look at as a deductible, and it typically is 90 days. So after... Now, elimination period means a time where uh, the, the insurance company doesn't pay. It's a waiting period. It's a waiting period. Correct. Okay. All right. okay. But to, to, and, and, um, to qualify, once that period's over, to qualify for care, you have to, be, uh, have to be certified that you need help with two of the activities of daily living, two out of the six. And those are, I, uh, go, I like to go in order, uh, transferring, getting out of bed, uh, bathing, dressing, um, uh, eating, cognitive care, countenance, okay? So, and then cognitive, well, I said cognitive, 
but those are the six activities of daily living. So if you can't do, perform two of those out of the six, then you, your insurance would kick in. An average cost, I know it may be difficult because every policy, every person is mm -hmm. different, but can you give me a rough average that there might be for someone, um, an average buyer of a policy? People, can com people in their 60s can fit into a comfortable plan for around $200 a month. And I know though that, that women pay more than men, why is that? They do because if you look at every assisted living community or nursing home uh, in the area, it's populated mostly by women. They outlive us men <laughs> and so they're the ones that carry the most risk for the insurance company. Now I presume the younger you buy a policy, the cheaper the premium, but can you be too old to buy a policy? Well, that's a great question. It all, it all turns around health. You could be uh, 50 and, and not qualify because of bad health. You can be 80 and still qualify because of good health. And I've written people well into their 70s. Um, and of and course, you'll, you will be at a higher premium at that at that yeah, but, age, correct? But it all averages out because if you get it younger, you're going to be paying Pay for, for a longer, longer period of time. time. So it does average mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. The big question, I guess, is like any insurance, whether you're insuring your home or your car, there are different levels of coverage. You have to make the decision of what to buy. How do you go about determining how much coverage you need in long-term care? Yeah, well, when, when I sit down with folks and I counsel them, we first try to determine what their attitude towards insurance is and how much of that risk do they want to carry themselves or pass on to the insurance company. And, uh, and, and, and most people have a very conservative view, but some want to transfer all the risk, Chris, and so they say, I never want to think about it again. But I don't think that's very wise. I mean, you really have to take a look. And then beyond that, let's look at your assets and what your uh, ability to self-insure is and how much of those assets you want to protect. And then we find a happy medium, I think, is, is, is really the normal. Most people go that route. I've never known anybody who needed care to say, I wish I had less. They're always grateful <laughs> always for something. Uh, so that would be the message, work within your own budget. Find out what your budget is, what you're comfortable with, and then buy that level of care. And your risk care. tolerance as well. Yeah, if, if you're interested in long-term care insurance. You know, one of the things, speaking of interest in long-term care, one of the things that surprised me in my research was that only about 8% of Americans actually have these policies. Why such a low number when the actual risk is great? Well, it's not top of mind for most people. Those, I suspect that those people that do have that coverage have had an experience, either personally or through a family friend or, or co-worker, where they've seen the damage that's been done to that family, to the caregiver, to their assets, and now it's top of mind, and so they, they, they go out looking for it. <laughs> it becomes top of mind a little, a little late. It's a little late at that time, but at least uh, you know, it does kick in. So. Well, what's your best advice when you're faced with having to make that decision, whether it's uh, a decision that's forced upon you in the short term or whether you, you're actually thinking it? What's your best advice for consumers to deal with long-term care? Yeah, um, don't wait until you're in crisis mode. Don't wait until you pick up the phone and have to ask, what do I do with mama? which is a very common question I get. Have a plan in place, whether it's family or dependency on a, a government agency, or if you're going to self-insure, have money set aside and earmark for that, or get proper coverage in the form of insurance. But have a plan in place well before you think you're gonna need it. And the average, uh, the average person is uh, in their early 80s before they need that kind of care. So plan ahead. Let's close out with a, a look toward the future because in less than 15 years, 20% of our population is going to be over age 65. Uh, we've never faced that in America. Uh, it seems to me that there's going to be an inevitable crisis in long-term care. It's going to be a tsunami of a crisis in care. 
Uh, 10,000 of us are turning 65 every day, Chris. And, um, you know, part of the Affordable Care Act included uh, t what was called Title VIII, which was the long-term care component. That went into effect in October of 2011. In January of 2012, the government took it out of the Affordable Care Act, and in their own words, they said that the need will be so great and the financial cost will not be sustainable. And that's the government saying they can't pay for this. It's too much. Well, George. Think about that. Yes. Thank you very much for being on The Best Times, helping us to prepare oh, for long-term care. It's my pleasure. What happens to our personal property after we die? No one likes to dwell on that thought, and maybe that's why a recent internet survey revealed that nearly 60% of Americans don't have a will. Should you have a will? What happens if you die without one? Here are some answers. What is a will? A will is a legal document which transfers assets at death. It also names an executor of your estate. And if you have minor children, it names a guardian over your minor children. Who should have a will? Everyone should have a will. Uh, but primarily people with assets in excess of $50,000, because that's the limit to where you either have to go to probate or not go to full probate. Uh, people with minor children should have a will. Uh, people that may have a beneficiary who is disabled with a special needs, uh, needs to have a will. Um, uh, persons that have beneficiaries that are spendthrifts, people that will spend anything they receive on the first day they receive it, probably needs to have a last will and testament. What if you die without a will? As I tell everybody, how many people have a will, and they raise their hand, I'll say, how many people don't have a will, and they may not raise their hand, I say, well, you still have an estate plan. And that estate plan is determined by the state that you live in. If you live in Tennessee, it's determined by the state of Tennessee. If you die intestate without a last will and testament, then it increases the cost of the probate process and increases the time delay of the probate process. For example, if you die without a will, you'll have to post bond. Uh, your beneficiaries will have to have appraisals of all the, uh, the property. Uh, your beneficiaries will have to do an inventory of all the property. And then they'll have to do accountings, annual accountings of the income and expenses. All those things cost money, and as a result, decreases the amount of assets that get transferred to your beneficiaries. What is probate? Probate uh, in Latin means to prove. So when someone passes away, you're either proving that they have a valid last will and testament in court, or if they don't have a will, you're proving who their heirs at law are. It is a court process which takes time and costs money. Are there different types of wills? There are two basic types of wills. One's called an attested and one's called a holographic will. An attested will is the will you're going to get if you go to a lawyer. It's going to be a typewritten document. It's going to need to be signed by the testator. It's going to need to be witnessed by at least two witnesses. And probably also the witnesses' signatures will be notarized on the back, what they call a self-proving affidavit, so that when you pass away, we don't have to bring the witnesses to court or find the witnesses to bring them to court to testify. The second type of will is a holographic will. A holographic will is a will wholly in the handwriting of the person making out the will. It doesn't need a witness, doesn't need a notary, but it does require the signature, the full signature of the person making the will. Can you write your own will? And as I tell my clients, yes, you can buy a form will. And the forms are perfectly valid and perfectly legal. However, the issue is they have blanks, and what do you put in the blanks? And that's normally why you would need a lawyer to help you to fill in the blanks. What are the advantages of using a lawyer? Well, first of all, you get a professional that's preparing the document for you. You also have a professional that is basically stating to you that this document will be valid. And if it happens to be not valid, then you have professional to rely upon to make it valid. How much does a lawyer charge? Some lawyers charge by the hour. Some lawyers charge a fixed fee. All right. 
If you interview a lawyer, you want to ask them how do they charge for their services. You need to know that and all lawyers should be able to tell you how they charge. Most clients or people probably prefer a fixed fee because it's a known as a versus an unknown. Most time when you go to Walmart to go shopping, you're going to go and you're going to see the price on the shelf, whatever store you go to. I think that should also apply to estate planning with, with uh, lawyers. What the fee is going to be is going to be dependent upon what type of estate plan or will that you need. People with a simple estate is going to pay less. People with a complex estate is going to pay more. Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources. And send us your feedback and story ideas to besttimes at WKNO.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by the Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.